since I was young, I've wrestled with this question. If you had one superpower, what would it be? You guys remember that question? If you had one superpower, if you had one superpower, what would you, what would you, what would that superpower be? And you, you start off with, with kind of the basic, you start out with, well, I wish I could run really fast. And then you start to realize, well, running, who wants to run, man? If I could, why, why run if I could fly? If I could ask for any superpower, man, I'm going to fly. And that, that was always my default. I'm like, I, I want to fly for two reasons, because there's something beautiful about God's wonderful creation, and there's something about speed of being able to get there as fast as you possibly can. And then someone will correct you. They'll correct you rather quickly, and they say, well, why would you want the, why would you want the ability to run when you could make the decision to telepo- teleportation? You know, why not, like, snap your fingers or click your heels and, like, you can be home as fast as possible. And so, okay, well, 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 maybe that. Some people, if they're not thinking very clearly off the bat, they'll be like, oh, I wish I could be a mind reader. And then you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> it does not take very long to realize that I do not want to be a mind reader. Some would say time travel, perhaps. So it'd be kind of cool. Go find people in the past that you could go have lunch with or go forward into the future and figure out how you could make money in the present based on future predictions, all of that <laughs> stuff. You know, as I was thinking about that question, it was only last night that I realized that that's only one side of the question. The question is not, if you had one superpower, what would it be? The next question is, well, what would you do with it? Jesus is an interesting character. And there's something about the power of Jesus that is hard to understand. Our memory verse, as we're going through the series, called Then Jesus. It comes from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus will say this. Then Jesus came to his disciples and he said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Then Jesus came to his disciples and he said to them, all authority, all authority, I think you could translate sufficiently power, all power, all might, all authority has been given to me. In fact, would you, would you read that with me as, you, as, you, as you're there? Um, it says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And as I thought about it, I thought all authority is a lot of authority. All power is a lot of power. And it's like, what do you do with all of that authority and all of that power? And then I realized that sometimes when I think of authority, man, I keep it earthbound. And I think about kings, and I think about power, and I think about forces, and I think about weapons, and I think battles, and I think all power is that. And and then I realized that it's not just saying that all authority in heaven, on earth, it says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And what's intriguing about Jesus is what he does with his power. Sometimes it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to, to comprehend. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus will. Man, it's an interesting, it's an interesting moment in Jesus' ministry. People are getting, people are kind of getting indications of who, who Jesus is. They've perhaps been a witness to his baptism. And it says at his baptism that the, 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 the sky opened up and the voice of the Father said this. It says, this is my son. With him I am well pleased. And then we watch Jesus as he goes through the, through the wilderness and he goes through some temptations of, uh, of, of provision and of pride and of, and of power. And, and we watch him come through and then he sp- speaks on the mountainside and seeks to show humankind. This is what the love of the Father looks like. And then he goes about healing people. But in Matthew chapter 16, it's a I would say, pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry where he acknowledges that he is the Messiah. Wow. Now, the word Messiah, I mean, it literally means, it means anointed one. But the people of God for generations and generations had been longing for the Messiah. The Messiah was one who was said to, would, would be coming in the line of David 
And God made this promise to David, and I think it was in Chronicles where he'll say that, that David, that, that you will, one will come from your line who will forever sit upon the throne of Israel. And so, and so for generations, the, the, the people of God are longing because they knew that the world wasn't right. They knew that, they, they, that most of Israel's history, they're bounced back and forth between foreign invaders and they're longing, they're, they're longing for the day when the deliverer, when the hero of ages, when, when the king of all kings would arrive on the scene, the Messiah, the anointed one, the holy one. They're they're waiting his arrival. And so for generations and generations, stories are told from their grandparents to to grandchildren passed on through generations. Like, when is the Messiah going to come? How long until all things are restored? Because they were longing for restoration and they're ready for someone to do something about the foreign oppressors. So I'm not sure if I understand the total, total gravity of the awaiting of the deliverer, but it's interesting. That in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus acknowledges that he's it. The one the world has been waiting for. The hinge of human history. The deliverer of mankind. He's it. He's it. And I thought about that in terms of the disciples who've walked with them. Some of them, I mean, they're fishermen and they're tax collectors. And, and some of them are religious, are political zealots. And, and man, they come from all different backgrounds. And, and man, they don't know what all is going on. But, but can you imagine for that moment coming to the realization or hearing for the first time that the one that the entire, your entire history has been waiting for, he's standing there in front of you. And so we come to Matthew chapter 16, and this is what it says. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Ces- Caesarea, Caesar, Julius Caesar, power. Philippi, Philip, Philip of Mastodon, who's the father of Alexander of Great, power. And so it's an interesting spot. So when, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, and it's a very good question that he asked his disciples. This is what he says, who do people say the Son of Man is? And that's a, that, that is a question that is as relevant today as it was back then, because there's this question of who do people say that Jesus is? That's a good question. Like you're, you're going to go to work tomorrow or you're going to go to school tomorrow and, and there's going to be people around you who have had perhaps some experience of Jesus. And, and a worthy question is, well, well, who do people say that, that Jesus is? And I think that you'll find that I think the majority of the people will say, I'm not sure about Christianity and I'm not sure about all this religious stuff, but, but I can understand Jesus. I can, there's something about Jesus. And they might say, like your co-workers or your classmates, they might say, well, he was a really good teacher or, or he, he certainly had some types of influence. I mean, it's hard to not say that Jesus didn't have influence over the world. And so that might be some of their response. But Jesus asked this question. We'll get back to the question. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And it's a worthy question to wrestle through. And so this is what he, they, they go on to say. They replied, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others say Jeremiah are one of the prophets. But he said to them, but what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Like, that's what the crowds think, and that's what your coworkers might think, and that's what your classmates might, might think. And you start to realize that the second question is just as relevant as the first, perhaps even more when you talk about your own personal life. is like, okay, that's who they think they are, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And that's a, that's a question worth pausing. I would propose it is the question that changes everything. And I don't know where you are with that question. I would just challenge you to ask that question. Well, who do you say that Jesus is? Peter's kind of the boisterous one. He's the, usually the spokesman for all of the other disciples. Simon Peter answered, well, you are the Messiah. Again, I don't know that we can understand the gravity of that response. He says, you, you, you are the one we have been waiting for. You are the one that generations and generations have talked about. You are the one that the whole whole Old Testament, all the scrolls have been preparing us for. All the prophets have been looking for you. The power, the dominion, the, the, the total revolution of human history. Like you, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, which is an interesting pair when you think about it. You're not only the anointed king, you are the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. There are some things that maybe all of the people around you, they can help you along the journey, but it seems as though there's, there comes a moment where God will 
reveal himself to you. He says, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. But it's revealed to you by my Father in heaven. I tell you, Peter, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples to tell, not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Who do people say that I am? And they have a list. Well, some say John the Baptist, and that's because John the Baptist, uh, Herod, a couple chapters earlier, is seeing the miracles of Jesus, and he's convinced that, that John the Baptist has come back to life again. He says, well, some will say Elijah. Elijah was prophesied that Elijah would come back, like he would come back to life. And, and so, and, and Elijah was a man. Man, God was doing some powerful things through this guy named Elijah. And, and, and so they're like, well, perhaps this is Elijah come back again. It says some, um, some say Jeremiah, which is an interesting one. Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet that often talked about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And now, now Jesus, will, you'll sometimes find in his language, he'll say something like this. He'll say, destroy this temple and I will build it again in, in three days. And so like, well, maybe he's Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so they're wrestling with who Jesus is, which is a beautiful wrestling match to figure out who Jesus is. But then he says to them, and this, this is the question of all questions that is for you right now at this very moment. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And it's then that Peter will say those words. You are the one who holds all power that the world and all of human history has been waiting for. And Jesus says yes. We can't dodge his answer that he says yes. And I don't know that I, I can't really put myself in the shoes, their shoes, to realize that every hope and dream of their restoration was standing there right in front of them. And I bet they were excited. I bet they were so excited. Jesus is the Messiah. And Peter, and James and John, and the disciples, I don't think it's too, too far to guess that they are strategizing. It's time to go to Jerusalem and take the city. It's time to go to Jerusalem and take the temple. It's time to set ready for battle to go against the Roman oppressors because the King of Kings is here. He's on our side. Let's do it. All power, all authority, everything is there standing right in front of us. His name is Jesus. He's just told us the Messiah. Let's get after it. It's time to set up the earthly kingdom. It's time to go after all the foreign invaders and all the foreign oppressors, oppressors of generations and generations. Let's get after it, Jesus. But what you'll find about Jesus is that Jesus is the Messiah, but he is not the Messiah that they expected. And this is where things get strange. And this is where things get confusingly beautiful. Because what Jesus says next, as much as at that moment they were on the highest of highs, running, ready to run after their thrones and their crowns, in a heartbeat, Jesus points them to a cross. And it doesn't make sense. The power of Jesus is hard to understand. This is what Jesus says next. From that time on, from that time on, yes, I am the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. All right, we're on the right path. He must go to Jerusalem and suffer. Wait, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the, the elders? 
He must suffer many things at the hands of the, wait, he must suffer many things at the hands of the, the chief priests? <laughs> wait, wait. He must suffer many things at, at, at the teachers of the law. He must be killed. He must be, what did it do? He, he must be killed on the third day. He must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Now, verse 22, Peter took him aside. Peter took him aside because Peter knows the script. Cut. Stop the cameras. Someone bring Jesus his lines. The Messiah is Israel's deliverer. The Messiah is the one who's going to come in power. His dominion of all dominions. Or read the book of Daniel. It'll talk about the Son of Man, which Jesus referenced as himself. The Son of Man will come in the clouds in his glory, and he will set all the nations straight, and he will rule with an iron scepter. Guys, we're going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. Guys, we're going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer. Guys, I know you're longing for a crown and a throne. You're going to get a cross and a tomb. And just like Peter, I struggle to understand the power of Jesus. Because I often say, what could I do with it? But my response is often Peter. It's like, Listen to what Peter says. <laughs> Listen to what Peter says. That Peter took him aside. <laughs> That's a funny phrase. Peter took the Messiah aside. Peter took the power of all powers aside and began to rebuke him. I'm like, what a dummy, Peter. And I'm like, how many times have I done that in my life? And he began to rebuke him and he says, never, Lord. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. That is not what power does. Power triumphs. Power conquers. Power finds those who are rebelling against it and puts it back in line. What power does is power takes control. This will never happen to you. And Jesus' response is, he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things or concerns of God but human concerns. The good news of Jesus is incredible news. But it is strange. The God of all creation who holds all power and all authority, the God who made this world. The scriptures are right about Jesus and will say he is before all things, he is in all things, he's created all things, all things were created by him and for him, and through him all things have their existence, and all things are in him. It's like he is everything. And he confusingly came to die. He didn't just come to die. He came to die at the hands of those who he created. Jesus was not the Messiah we expected. And to be honest, he may not be the Savior that you expected. That he will meet you at your worst. He will meet you in your rebellion. He will meet you in your rejection. He will meet you in all power. And he says this, I give my life for you so that you can find life in me. I don't understand that type of king. A king that would come to die for me. A king that humankind would put a crown of thorns and put a robe on him and spit on him and mock him as he is holding all power. When he could call down legions upon legions of angels to 
be his deliverer, or let's be honest, speak a word and have a thought and have it all go away. This is the love of God, not that, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and he gave himself for us. And I can tell you, I don't always, I don't know if I will ever understand that. But I'm drawn to it. I am enamored by it. And so Jesus tells Peter, and Peter says, no, 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 that's not the way. And there's so many times in my life, and I'm going to assume maybe in your life, it's like, no, 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 God, that's not the way you use power. <laughs> and Jesus says, this is what I'm doing. And then Jesus does something else. That, <laughs> oh, man. He, uh, he, uh, he then flips the script. Because they have a script. And their script is glory. And their script is victory. And their script is go after every enemy and finally pay them back for everything that we have gone through in human history. Their script is finally the power is at our hands. We can do something with it. And Jesus, are you the Messiah? Yes, I'm the Messiah. Yes, let's get after it. He says, no, I'm dying. And by the way, Come with me. Jesus goes on to say this. Then Jesus. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple. And can I tell you that first word is the greatest invitation to any person everywhere because it says whoever Whoever is the one that you are praying for, at one church we pray for one, we say, Lord, please give me one person to share your love with. Will you all pray that with me? Lord, please give me one person to share your love with. They are a whoever. And what Jesus says is that whoever wants to be my disciple. In other words, you are invited into the family of God. And then he says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. This is the script. And you're like, well, it's not the script that I expected. And like, well, the script you expected might have been all about you and all about what you want to do and all about who you want to take out. Jesus says, my script is better. He says, for whoever who wants to save their life, they will lose it. But whoever's willing to lose their life for me, they will find it. And there is, a, there is gold in that sentence. The more you try to chase and build your own life, the more self-centered you start to become and the more everything is wrong, but the more you're able to say, God, take this life and use me for your purposes and for your will. That's when you start to see what real life is. And so he says, what good would it be for someone to gain the whole world? And that is a good question. Yet forfeit their soul or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man, he's going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some of you who are standing here today will not taste death before the, they see the Son of Man coming in all his glory. I don't know what script you came in here with. I don't know what script you have. And if you're like me, usually it's a script that I have written. <laughs> Some plan that I have charted out that usually has me like somehow winning or at the advantage. And Jesus says, no, I want you to flip the script daily. He says, if you want to come after me, deny yourself. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound very fun. Denying myself? Who? That's, the world doesn't say that. The world's like, chase it. Like, get after everything for self. Because if, if it's not you, who else is going to do it? And I think Jesus will tell you that will lead you very fast into a life of misery. 
That's why the script is such an interesting script. It's upside down. He's like, you want to find meaning and purpose in your life? Let go of yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Well, that's getting less fun. <laughs> like, there's deny myself, and there's just take up a cross. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Take up a cross? It's like, well, no, like, you were not built for comfort. You were not made for the cozy life. You were made for the adventure that God is calling you into. And that means it's going to be hard. It doesn't mean that it's a, an easy road, but there's no better road that you can walk. And you're like, well, well what, is the, what is the difficulty along the road? I don't know, but you probably do. Some ways in which God is calling you, like, I will do anything but that. And Jesus will say, take up your cross. The one that you're praying for. The people that God has called into your life. I mean, you can move in your power, you can move in God's power. And he says, you can move in my power, and, and you'll start to see the way in which God starts to work through your life. And there's something very exciting about that. There's nothing boring about our faith. And then he'll say, follow me. You see, the thing about Jesus is, the thing about God is that everything he calls us into, he goes before us. So follow me. Let's, some ha let's have some fun in this world. I'm thinking about that question of if you had one superpower, what would it be? And then I realize you already have him. Or you're invited into him. His name is Jesus. that I know that there are supernatural things happening in your life. And you're like, well, I don't feel the supernatural things. Like, I know because I know who God is that there are supernatural things in your life. And I would also say that there are supernatural things that he wants to do through you because you know your insecurities and you know your flaws and problems and sins and failures. You know all of that. And Jesus will say, no, I still want to work through you supernaturally to impact the world that I have placed you in. So let go of yourself and step into sacrifice and follow me. Our memory verses. Our memory verses. Then he came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, but you got to watch what it says next. All authority, all power in heaven and earth is mine. Therefore, as you go about your life, I want you to tell more and more people about the type of king that comes and dies for his creation. I want you to, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he says this, and surely I am with you always. My power is always there, always present at work for you, for, in you and through you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work in you right now. And I would say that that's what your life, that's what you were invited into. So Jesus is the Messiah. He's not the Messiah we, he expected. He flips the script and then he says, now, walk it with me. I don't understand that type of power. But I'm in. And you're invited to be into that. And all of the things that this world chases and all the things that we contend to chase, all of, the, all of the ways in which we want to go every direction, Jesus will say, no, seek me. Seek first my kingdom. And you'll find out what it's like to live with power. If you're at home and you have the ability to participate in this moment of communion through bread or through drink or you can participate it even by saying yes to Jesus. There's this moment when the God of creation who took on flesh said to his disciples the Messiah the deliverer the anointed one who holds all the power of the universe, says this, this is my body given for you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. We take to the king. He took the cup. And the king of kings, the Lord of lords, 
the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Deliverer, who then invites us into relationship with Him and into adventure of turning the world upside down as He did with 12 men. This is my blood poured out for you. Now come do this with me. We take to the King. Can I pray for you? Lord, may I never take for granted that even now we get to speak to the power of all powers. And that is something that we don't understand. But Lord, we say yes to the invitation to let go of ourselves. We say yes to the invitation of taking up the cross and, and walking with you, no matter what that cost might be. And following you because we know that, that you who emptied himself is... That you, the one who was crucified on the tree, that you, the one who was buried in the tomb, is also the one raised to life again. And so we are free. We are free from sin and chains and death itself. Lord, may we live in your power and not ours. May we do mighty things. May you do mighty things through us by your power. So in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.